Hi folks, welcome back to the Horde. So, it's about 12.30, it is August 5th, Tuesday, 84.3 degrees, that says 82 degrees, and for folks that are international, 26.5 degrees. Like I mentioned it was Tuesday, and check this out. My batteries, the sun's out. Batteries are all charged up. Normally, the um, during the um, peak of summer, you know, anywhere between um, the end of May, middle to end of May, until um, the uh, middle to end of July, you, you know, I it's it's hard for my batteries to be charged because. They're on the other side of that glass, and when the sun's up real high, you know, the angle isn't good. As the sun starts going lower on the horizon, actually more light gets to the solar, to two solar panels there, and the batteries charge better. Theoretically, there's 30 watts of solar panels there, so um, for maintaining, you know, that deep charge battery, they should really have no sweat, but given that they're on the wrong side of low E glass, and, uh, they don't—they just don't get much light. So, anyhow, um, why are they on the wrong side of low E glass? Because here, um, where I live in the Hudson Valley, supposedly I need a building permit to put up solar panels. They want to come and inspect, um, and that. In some respects, it makes sense. In some respects, it doesn't. Given that I'm in a rural area, and if I don't put up solar panels correctly, if they blow off my roof or something, chances of them hitting somebody are fairly small. And if they do take somebody out, it'll probably be me or my family, more likely me, because I'm really the only one who floats around outside. Um, that makes it my problem, my fault, my situation. So... You know, it doesn't make much sense. But then you have other people who live like in condos or in um, in cluster housing. And if you have solar panels flying off their roofs and, you know, killing neighbors' kids and all that, I guess to some extent it it makes, um, makes sense that you don't just want them uh, floating about. Purpose of this video. GM lover. Why don't we take a quick look at some coils and some ignition systems and some stuff like that and um, see if I can help you troubleshoot your, your all-terrain vehicle problems. I had one of these meters I unfortunately blew up. Um, these are those cheap ones from Harbor Freight. Yeah, this is one I blew up. See, I'm shorting the leads together and I'm not getting anything on it. So, I cooked that meter. You know... Um, every once in a while these things happen. Okay, what are we up to? Just so happens, I opened up the garage door and I realized I had a perfectly positioned bike right here. So, you should recognize this engine. Basically, from the engine itself, built into the engine, you have two um, components which create your spark. You have the um, stator that's on the other side of this thing and you have this um, uh, pulser as it's known. If you go between, let's see if I can't actually set this up here so that you can see the meter whilst I talk without dropping my camera on the ground and breaking it. I think you guys can actually see it. Anyway, what I'm going to do is let's do a quick, and you can even see that. You, I'm going to do a quick test between the stator and ground, and you'll be able to see the reading. See, 212 ohms. Okay. And what does that mean to you? That means if it's anywhere between 100 and 3 or 400 ohms, it's probably fine. You know, 150, 
to 350 one between one and 400 ohms it's probably fine okay so that's one thing and the way I tested this is I put one lead here and I don't know could you guys see that this is black and red and I put the other lead to ground right and you guys could see it right so black and red to ground somewhere around 200 ohms give or take a foot and a half now I'm gonna go between these two leads with the meter and you're gonna see somewhere around 30 ohms Thirty-four, thirty-three, you know, somewhere around thirty ohms. See that thirty-three point one, somewhere around thirty ohms. So, those are two tests you want to perform. So. Somewhere around 200 ohms on the stator, somewhere around 30 ohms on that. Just to refresh what this looks like, should you tear that off and tear the flywheel off, you have one of these beneath it. This is the line, wire you're looking at. It's black and red. And if you have it loose like this, you just put one on the case and the other one here. I don't know how well this is going to cooperate. Give me one second. I plugged one in here. By the way, you really have to make sure you get good contact when you plug that one in. That's why I mentioned I don't know how well it's going to cooperate. And I'm probing the other one there. And you see 212 ohms. And now, once again, checking this. We're going to see how good the one-handed man is. Some of you guys are really good at testing this stuff out, working with one hand, and some of us are not that good. I would consider myself not that good. Well, uh, take my word for it. It's somewhere around 30 ohms. So, but you guys can see how that works. I hope this helps a little bit. Um, what went wrong? My my experience on electrical systems, if they're running and then suddenly you bring them home and the next morning they're not running, I, you, you know, sometimes the uh, float sticks and it washes your spark plug out. So I always start out by changing, you want to change the spark plug first. Even if it's like a new plug, change it again. You can't change. And when you're troubleshooting an electrical system, you, you know, you don't want to be screwed up for a $6 spark plug or $5, $3, whatever you're paying for spark plug. So always be suspicious of the spark plug. The second thing I'd wonder about is the on and off switch. The bike I got from Stony, this stick, stick figure bike, you know, you and your stick figure family. This thing here has a very loose on and off switch, but it's hooked up. It works. So you'll be riding along and this thing here will just, uh, right, you know, so just, or just, you know move a little bit and turn itself off i mean it got to the point where i'd re recognize that and just you know kind of flick it and it would fire itself right back up if i was moving and haul me about so i would be always suspicious of the spark plug i'd be suspicious of the on and off switch and then you know what else are you doing as you're riding around right you're moving which could bother some of these wires so i'd always give them a check if you take a look in the headlight bucket 
and this is a real bad example of that. As a matter of fact, this bike, um, I've, I don't think I ever used the real electrical system to run this 200M. I think I always ran it on my portable C CD box, right? My, my portable ignition system, it just seemed like it was easier, right? With the portable ignition system, all you need are these two wires. Everything else comes out of the box. Um, so, I spent 10 minutes telling you about this. I hope it helps. I also um, directed you to that ATC or ATV forum link. Um, you know, every website I go to, I kind of get a different idea. I learn something new. From that particular website, I learned out, I learned that, um, and I don't know, are any of these easy to see? I learned that you can use the little China CDI boxes, the small, small ones for the 200S. Neither one of these have a harness on them. Shoot. Oh, wait. No, I don't have a harness on either of these. Um, anyway, and you could buy those little China CDI boxes cheap. They're only like nine bucks each. I don't know, 10, 11 bucks delivered. So um, that's that's really helpful. I learned that from that ATV forum website, from um, William Shatton's Statton's uh, website. I learned that you can actually, you know, create your own little portable CDI unit. You can kind of build one and put batteries in a box and all that. I, you know, he he didn't build one, but he was talking about using these China CDI units on um, on other bikes, right? So I took it a step further and jammed everything into into one box, you know. Set it up with the um, so when you turn it on, the little light comes on there, right? So you know that you have ignition. Went with the cool Batman switch. Um, so with this thing here, all you have to do is hook up to ground on the frame, ground on the um, on the um, pulse generator, hot on the pulse generator, and the coil, right? So no matter how screwed up your ignition system is or your wiring is, you know, all you basically need is a pulse generator just to give the CDI box some timing, right, to tell, to tell the CDI box when to fire. And you got ignition, right? So you can have this whole rat's nest, but all you need, are, if you have these two wires, right, you hook, once again, the red wire here, the one black wire here, and one black wire to a fin, put the spark plug wire on and you, you got yourself ignition, you're running. And you're running off of um, batteries. Uh, the drain doesn't appear to be all that big. You can probably run a few hours on it. So if you're out in the bush even, and you gotta get back, once again, as long as your CDI here works, or your, your pulse generator works, you're all good. Anyway, guys, whenever you have ignition problems, give me a quick ask. We'll give it a try. There's one of the other um, YouTubers out there who asked me about a, um, it was a China bike, and he said it had a really hacked up harness, and he managed to get it to spark again, but it won't fire. Um, that, that's, that's a, that's a tough one because you you don't know what somebody else did. You don't know if they put the right CDI box in there. Though chances are, if it's firing, hopefully it's the right CDI box. But you don't know if the timing's right and all that other kind of crap. But I mean, it's hard. It's really rough when when you got somebody that you're messing with something. Somebody already boogered up like that. You know, you're really kind of scratching your head. Um, back to it. I would figure out what wires are doing your pulse generator thing and use my portable box and I'll get the thing fired up and hopefully from there you, you know okay I know my pulse generator is good and then you start working your way through the wires you know what are my um, what are the wires that that is giving me my stator 
ground is typically case, you know, and, and you go forward. By the size of the CDI box, if it's a really big box, I mean, like huge, like, you, you know, not the square little ones about the size of my thumb. I mean, the ones like, you know, big, right? Like half the size of my hand. I'm exaggerating with that, but you, when you see the big CDI units, you know when you got one. Some of those actually use 12 volts to make them go. And if you kind of um, poking around with the harness and looking at the harness, you can kind of figure it out. Um, that particular individual also mentioned that he had like a thousand grounds. Um, yeah, I noticed that also on the Chinese CDIs. They seem to have grounds all over the place. Um, I, uh, yeah, uh, ch probably what happened is they had some kind of remote kill switch or something like that that might account for a bunch of the grounds that's on there. Because to have a remote kill switch, you have to power the remote kill switch, which requires ground and hot. And then you also have to ground your ignition system, which is another ground, and then to the ignition system. So, like, one, one of those portable or one of those remote kill switches drives um, so much more wiring. It, like, doubles the amount of wiring you have. Anyhow, I've been babbling for 16 minutes. I hope the demonstrations with the meters helped. These meters here, um, whenever I have a coupon, I go get another one from Harbor Freight. Um, let me just warn you, uh, they blow up really, really easy. Um, and the right thing to do when they blow up, I think this one still does voltage, but it doesn't do ohms. So I, sh I should either write voltage across it, or I should just throw it away because it was free and get another one and take another one out of a package and use it. Because there's nothing worse than trying to troubleshoot a problem with a bad meter. If you got a dead meter, go get another meter, especially once again from Harbor Freight with the coupon. You could get them for free. And even if you have to buy the miserable things, I think they go on sale from Harbor Freight. You could buy a mail order for like $2.99. Just go get yourself a, a decent meter. And at $2.99, if you're paying the postage and all that, buy yourself, you, you know, like... A half a dozen of them spend the 20 bucks you know get them delivered to your house put one in each car in your toolbox and everything else learn how to use your dvm and uh, you'll be a happy person um this is the first i think i'm going to make three videos today this is the first of three um, I was poking around down in the basement. I just want to show you guys a couple of interesting things I ran across. Um, whenever I'm poking around through the through the horde, I occasionally find stuff that's amusing, and I figured I'd share some of that amusement with you. Anyway, folks, thank you for watching. Thank you for commenting. Thank you for subscribing. We'll catch you on the next episode of the horde, which will be real soon. Uh, bye now, and remember, smile. Folks will wonder what you're up to.